What is up my friends? Today on Real Chemistry, we're talking about metabolism. That's basically the process by which your body converts food into usable energy. Where does that energy ultimately come from? Well, it comes from the sun, which rains down, well, rains, that would be a funny way to put it, which shines down light on plants, which produces sugar through photosynthesis. And then we eat various portions of the plant, uh, like our good friend squirrel over here, and our body converts those portions into usable energy. Now, of course, we might also eat other animals which have done this same process to get energy. How does our body do this, though? How does it take the food and convert it to energy? It does that through metabolism, which is defined as the chemical reactions in living organisms that produce energy. The main one we want to focus on is the conversion of this sugar glucose into energy. Why do we focus so much on that one? Well, it turns out if we can understand how glucose is converted to energy, then later on we'll see that regardless of what we're eating, we basically just plug it in at various points of this process. So this is like the main engine that drives the conversion of our nutrients into food. So we want to understand this process of converting glucose, which is sugar, it's also blood sugar, into energy. And if we understand that, we can understand our metabolism in general. Well, how do we do this? Well, it's basically a combustion reaction and your body runs it really slowly. Combustion means combining with something with oxygen to basically burn it, right? So why do we inhale oxygen? Precisely so that we can combine it with sugar to burn it. We produce CO2 and water, same thing your car puts out of its exhaust, pretty crazy. And we get our energy. Now that energy is the key. And if you, you know, if you burn something, if you light something on fire, it makes fire. We don't wanna do that to our bodies. So what our bodies do instead is they run this really slowly over tons and tons of steps. And so that's why we're going to look at all these different steps in sort of a summary way right now. This energy, though, uh, is, you know, here just stated as energy, which is sort of nebulous. What molecule is it? Well, it turns out to be ATP. So we need to take a look at ATP. ATP is the main energy carrying molecule in our body. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. It actually looks very much like one of the nucleotides in DNA. So if you just look at this portion, it has a sugar, it has a phosphate group, and it has a base. Exactly the basic structure that we saw in DNA. But interestingly here, we add two more phosphate groups onto it. So notice we can count the phosphate groups, one, a two, a three. So guess what? There's three phosphate groups on it. And this base over here, it's called adenosine. So that's why we get adenosine triphosphate. What happens is our body makes this stuff through the use of glucose. So it breaks down glucose and over time produces a bunch of ATP. Then that courses around our body. We have ATP go and run things like our muscles. So your heart beats by using ATP, but it also runs all sorts of processes that require energy throughout your body. So it's the main thing in our body that we can readily use for energy. And when we use it, one of the phosphate groups pops off. So basically what constantly happens is we go back and forth between ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, and ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. So that's what your, so ATP constantly goes to ADP, right? And it's cycled back and forth. The way we should look at this is kind of like a charged and undischarged battery. So ATP is charged up, ready for use. You've just plugged your iPhone in and it's charged all night. ATP is ready to go, okay? You go and you power some muscles, well battery's empty, okay? It goes to ADP. So ATP is constantly cycled back and forth. And the question we wanna ask is how do we make the ATP that we then can go and use? You know, if you wanna charge your cell phone, you plug it into the wall, how do we metaphorically speaking charge up our cell phone? How do we get this ATP? That's where metabolism comes in, okay? So how do we get ATP from glucose is the fundamental question we want to look at in this lesson. And we're just gonna go over it in a big summary, high level picture. And then over the next week or two, we'll go over it in more depth. Okay, first up, the very first thing we do is glycolysis, okay? So glycolysis starts with glucose, just like we'd expect. And if you look at the word glycolysis, you might have a hint at what goes on here. Lysis, remember, means to split, and glyco refers to the glucose. So basically we're gonna split glucose in half. How does that work? Well, we take ATP, so this is actually interesting. I said we were gonna make ATP. Here in the very first step of glycolysis, we actually use ATP, which is crazy, but don't worry, we'll get our money's worth. So, right, this is just like if you start a business, you have to invest some money to get some money out. Glycolysis is the same way. We got to invest some ATP to eventually make some ATP. So they cram ATP onto glucose and then it splits in half. That's what this little separation of arrows is indicating here. It splits in half into two separate molecules and we get out a few things. We get out an ADH, we'll talk about what that is, ATP, ATP. 
okay? And we get that out on the top channel and the bottom channel. So we split it in half and we make ATP and NADH. What's NADH? NADH is another molecule our body uses for energy. And we'll see that eventually we're gonna turn NADH in to make ATP. So ultimately NADH just hangs around for a while and eventually is converted into ATP. So it's kind of like a currency that helps us use, that helps us get energy in our body, but ultimately we have to convert it into another form before you can use it. So for example, it's like you go to Europe and you have dollars. Well, that's still basically money, but before you wanna spend it, you're gonna to have to convert it into euros. Same thing here, NADH is an energy carrying molecule and it's energy, but our body can't use it. It needs to be converted into ATP. That's actually the last step of metabolism we'll talk about. Okay, so if we think about what we started with, we started with a glucose. How many ATP did we make? Well, remember we invested two and we got out one, two, three, four. So how many did we on net make? We made two glucose. Just like if you invested $2 in lemonade, great investment, and then you sold it for $4, you would have made two bucks. Same thing here. We made two net ATP. How many NADH did we make? Well, one, so we made two NADH. And then at the end, we have our carbon containing molecules that came from glucose. So remember, glucose has six carbons, right? And pyruvate has one, two, three. And we get out two separate pyruvates. So basically, our glucose has been split in half, and we've started to get some energy out of it. So how many pyruvates do we get out? We get out two. Now, you might be like, hey, what the crap is pyruvate? Why do I care about that? Well, basically, we just split the glucose in half, and these are the parts we got, and now we're gonna use those in the next step to continue to make energy. So the next step is the conversion of pyruvate. So we convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA and NADH. This turns out to occur at the mitochondria, and you can see here that we start with pyruvate, that's three carbon-containing molecules. We get out one NADH, and we convert this guy into acetyl-CoA. Why are we doing this? Well, it turns out that the next step needs to start with acetyl-CoA. But we also get out some energy, some NADH. Remember that NADH is a molecule eventually we can turn in for ATP, so we're kind of happy about the progress we've made even in this process of converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. Now that we have acetyl-CoA, we can go into the next and frankly most complicated step of the metabolism process. All right, so we got acetyl-CoA. We're going to plug that into what's called the citric acid cycle. It's called a cycle because we start with this molecule, oxaloacetate, and when we get all the way back around, we get back out oxaloacetate, and we just repeat over and over again. Every single time, what we do is we load an acetyl-CoA into the cycle, and we get out all sorts of stuff. So the major reactant, the major thing we put in is acetyl-CoA. What we get out are all sorts of energy-carrying molecules. So for example, we get out NADH. How many NADH do we get out? Well, we get out one here, one there, and one there. So that's three total NADH. How many FADHs do we get out? We get out one, one FADH. And then lastly, how many ATP do we get out? Well, we get out one right here. So this is all occurring in the mitochondria where we've loaded up the acetyl-CoA. And you'll notice that we're continuing to process our carbons into energy, either ATP or these NADH, FADH things. FADH is just like NADH, another energy carrying molecule. Okay, so now we've produced even more molecules. Question, how many times can I run the citric acid cycle if I put in one glucose? Well, when I put in one glucose, I get out two pyruvates and two acetyl-CoA's eventually. And so this whole cycle can be run two times for every single glucose molecule you put in, okay? And that'll be important to keep in mind when we go and actually calculate how much ATP, NADH, FADH you ultimately get out of one molecule of glucose. Okay, last and final step is oxidative phosphorylation. Here's where we finally turn in our NADH and FADH for ATP. So the way this works is pretty complicated and we won't go through any of the details here, but basically within the mitochondria, there's two membranes. So you can see right here that we have what's called the mitochondrial matrix, this blue stuff here. And then we have an outer membrane and we have an inner membrane at the edge of the mitochondrial matrix. And it's right at that interface between the mitochondrial matrix and the uh, rest of the mitochondria that we have this happening. Okay, so it's like right here. And what happens is we have a bunch of hydrogen ions on one side of the membrane and none on the other, and the hydrogen ions rush through. And as they do that, your body harnesses that energy to make ATP. Okay, so that may sound complicated and we'll dive into that in more detail in a later video. Basic point though, is we turn in NADH and FADH2 for ATP. Okay, let's sum up, that was a lot. Summary, four processes in metabolism. First up, glycolysis. Where does it occur? It occurs in the cytosol. It starts with glucose, 
and it makes ATP, NADH, and pyruvate. Notice that whatever our previous step ends with, that's really what's going to start our next step. So we just ended with pyruvate. That's the rem remnant of our sugar we started to break down. And then we start with pyruvate in the next step, which is pyruvate conversion to acetyl-CoA. It occurs in the mitochondria, and we get out an acetyl-CoA and one NADH. Okay, when we get out that acetyl-CoA, that's what's going to be put into the next step, which is our citric acid cycle. And that occurs in the mitochondrial matrix, that inner portion of the mitochondria. And there we put in, as I've mentioned, acetyl-CoA, and we get out all these energy-carrying molecules. Notice at this point, we don't have some carbon-containing molecule left. So pyruvate went to acetyl-CoA, and now it's just gone. Where did it go? Well, it turns out it went to CO2. So all the carbons are now converted into CO2. Okay, last step. We have all of this ATP. That's good. We can just go ahead and distribute that around the body for use. But we can't use the NADH uh, and FADH. So that has to be converted to ATP. That's what our last step does, oxidative phosphorylation. It occurs at the, in the mitochondrial membrane, and it starts with NADH and FADH and produces a bunch of ATP. Okay, last point, and then we're done. This whole middle section here, right, starts with one pyruvate. Meanwhile, our very first step put out two pyruvates. That means this all gets run twice for each glucose. So I put in one glucose, I'm going to run glycolysis once, pyruvate conversion twice, and the citric acid cycle tw twice. Counting how many times oxidative phosphorylation occurs is more complicated. We'll cover that when we actually go over that process in detail. Okay, so this is just a high-level summary. Now we'll spend time going through each one of these in more detail.